Thank you, Brother Jose and our bell choir, and of course, our beginner band earlier. Praise the Lord for the discipleship of their musical gifts, music being such a powerful thing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the beauty of these sweet melodies and harmonies, and I pray, Lord, may that be in our hearts, may it be in our homes, and may it be in, in this church. Guide us now as we look into your word and as you look into our hearts. We put them before you, Lord, to search and know. And may we know you. And thank you that you will continue to strengthen, redeem, and bless. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I want to talk with you about what's wrong with the church. I could preach a sermon on what's wrong with the pastor but he's part of the church. So we'll stick with the church. And I could talk about the conference, what's wrong with the conference, or the union, or the division, or the general conference, but we'll stick with the church, and we'll stick with ourselves. Uh, I've worked for this church, which is structured for God for the last 30 plus years, and I've been on a journey, a journey of my own. And this morning, I want to remind you that there are no new secrets about how to heal and grow a church. I was filling out a uh, card for a new married couple recently, and I wrote in the card, there are no new secrets to how to have a good marriage. And I want you to know, when Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, that's because the wisdom that we need, especially in the age of the availability of the scriptures, is ours. And that wisdom is from God's. Now, we're living in an age where there's a great emphasis on the individual and their liberties and their license and their assurance, etc. But this morning, I want to point us back to the simplest ways to have a beautiful life in Christ and a beautiful fellowship in Christ. Take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah 5, we're going to find the secrets to how to grow and have a beautiful fellowship with God and with each other. God is going to liken his church to a vineyard. Isaiah chapter 5, we'll begin with verse 1. It says, let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. All right, so this is a song. It's really meant to be somewhat of a courtship type song. It's a beautiful thing when someone wants to sing, but the song goes sour. It says, my well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it around. He removed its stones. He planted it with the choices of vine, and he built a tower in the middle of it. And he also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes but it produced only worthless ones. Oh, now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, make a determination between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I've not done in it? And why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I'll break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste, and it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but found bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. distress. So I want to say to every parent and every pastor this morning, as we examine this scripture along with the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh out of Galatians chapter 5, I want to say to you, if you put your best efforts into growing a beautiful garden, but instead what you got was wild stock that produced unrighteousness in its life. If you're a pastor who's tried to do these things, or a parent, don't give up hope. God isn't done. You're not done. 
until the people in your life are no longer walking upright and taking nourishment. This wasn't written to make us hopeless. But let's go back and look quite quickly at the things God did. Verse 1, it says, My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. It takes good soil to grow something. Now, I believe that what God plants in the human heart, if we look at the parable of the sower, it all grows. Everything God plants is fertile. But look what else God did. It said he dug it all around and he removed its stones. If you want a church to grow, if you and they should, especially since God is its architect and God is its nurturer and shepherd, if you want a family to grow, then there's going to have to be some fertile ground, which is why you don't rush into marriage, which is why you don't have premarital sex with your potential future marriage partner, because you might gloss over the fact that there's some stones in the ground, and they're going to stop us from putting down a deep rootstock. And by the way, pastors, you don't rush to put people in the baptismal tank and parents, you don't make mistakes about what's most prior to your kids. It's not, it's not the sports events or the music lessons. It's a walk with God and a home that's like a church. It's a place where you actually understand what is needed to produce a fruitful, beautiful life. So you remove the stones. I want to talk about some of those stones for just a minute. And especially to church leaders and pastors right now. I can remember through these last three plus decades, different stones that were in the way of these churches growing. I can remember uh, that lady who bought a new chair for her house and gave us the old chair for the church. I was offended by it. I think rightly so. I, I can remember in this church, let's just take the last 10 years, there was a period of time in which this church was didn't have a, a simple beauty to it. It was old and run down. And we decided that we were going to change that, praise the Lord. But in order to do that, we had to meet in the fellowship hall. And that meant every Friday we had to go set up chairs. And, you know, we had some complaining about setting up those chairs. And so I decided one day I'll go set them up myself. And I set them up myself in 45 minutes, and then I wondered really, what was the complaining about? It's just bad prioritization. It's just actually a lack of willingness to work. Removing the stones requires somebody to make some extra commu uh, commitment. I can remember in the early days of this church doing the communion service. You know, a communion service, when it works well, is a beautiful service. People move orderly. They get up and down and they flow. And there's a little bit of, uh, it, it's probably the closest thing to a ritual this church has. And rituals by themselves are not bad. Ritualistic religion where you don't have a living walk with Christ is a problem. But I can remember one of our general contractors saying to me they couldn't make it on time on Friday afternoon because they work for themselves. And I said to them, you're exactly the kind of person who can make it on time because you do set your own schedule. By the way, it's God's job to prosper our contractors. God's their partner. According to the book of education, when we practice the laws of thrift and frugality and hard work and faithfulness, God's to make our businesses a success. And when you're in control of your environment, you are exactly the people that are supposed to make the priorities that God asks you to make. I can remember some of the different things that were challenges here. And one of the phrases that we came up with was no more blemished offerings, only your best for God. And then I can remember one of the big bitter pills to swallow here, one of the big stones that need to be dug out of the ground is that the idea that you can hold a spiritual office here, but you don't need to come to the spiritual meetings and you don't need to make the spiritual commitments that would make a spiritual institution grow. And some people left. They refused to take their offices because there were now expectations on what it meant to be a spiritual leader. You know, there's stones in the ground. And if you want your kids' lives to go deep 
and bear up under the great winds of strife that are going to blow and only blow stronger into the future. If you want your church to stand, you're going to have to dig some stones out of the ground. God's not going to make you do it, and he's not going to do it for you, although he will allow you to recognize them, and he will say, let's remove this. He planted the choicest vine. There was no bad rootstock. God planted his Old Testament church in the heart of Abraham, his friend. And you know, the, the problem is, is that even though he planted a choice rootstock over time, almost maybe epigenetically, if you want to say that, or, or whatever corruption of the uh, pollination processes, over time something went wrong. The experience of the founders was not the experience of the leaders in the day of Isaiah. And then he built a tower. It's important to have good rootstock. It's important that we don't just clep out of some of the experiences that make us grow. You don't put anybody in that baptistry tank in order to get them salvation. You put them in the baptistry tank because they've been well discipled and you know they've encountered the living Christ and have had a salvational experience with the author of the universe who's remaking their lives. And when we hurry people into the baptismal tank, we hurry the future demise of the church because without proper cultivation, some of the weeds that shouldn't be in the garden are alive in the hearts of the people who needed a little more time to let God search them and know them. You build a tower. Why do you build a tower? You build a tower because some things belong in the garden and some things don't. You build a tower because somebody's got to watch over it to make sure the wild boars don't come and stick their strong snouts in the ground and root up everything that you've tried to plant. Around here, we build large fences, sometimes with electricity running in them, because we don't want the deer eating everything we planted. And he hewed out a wine vat. Why? Because anybody that plants a garden is working for the produce of the garden. But it didn't work. He expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. But there's more that he did if we read on. He wants to know, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my church, because that's what the vineyard represents. What more was there for me to do, verse 4, than I have not done? And when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. Now, this explains a little more what he had already done. I will remove its hedge. There's a wall around every good church, around every good marriage, around every good home. Because some things get in and some things are kept out. I'm going to remove my hedge, he says. I'm going to break down its wall and it's going to become trampled. I'm going to lay it waste. Verse 6, it will not be pruned or hoed. Pruning. Nobody wants anybody in our lives pruning us. I mean, if the church is a vineyard or a garden, who's supposed to have the right and the prerogative to hold the pruners? That's scary. And how about hoeing? There's not supposed to be weeds growing in here. So somebody, listen to me pastors, listen to me parents, somebody's got to be enough aware of what a weed is. And when it gets growing, it's always easier to deal with a weed earlier than later. But God says no more pruning, no more hoeing. The briars and the thorns are going to grow up. And I'll also charge the clouds not to rain on it. For the house, the vineyard is the house of the Lord and the men of Judah, his delightful plan. But instead of justice, he found bloodshed. And righteousness was gone, and what was left was a cry of distress. So this morning, I want to go on a little journey to show you how to have a beautiful garden in your heart, in your home, and in your church. And I'm hoping that these words find resonance in the minds of the moms and the dads, the leaders of the church, and each of our members. Take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 15. This is a little epistle written to a young pastor by Pastor Paul. So go in the New Testament, Timothy, 
Well, first it goes to Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus. They're alphabetical. T-H-T-I-T-I-T. All right, let's find it. Titus, chapter 2, and I want to focus on verse 15. Now, one of our famous verses is found in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope in the appearing and the glory of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll keep reading verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. But verse 15 is where I really want to go, parents. Verse 15 is where we need to be, pastors. These things, okay? And the New Testament is the greatest behavior modification book in the world. I should have got a better amen. The greatest changer in the world, the only change agent in the world, is Jesus Christ. But when Christ comes in, the change continues. And the problem is we're living in an age where we want to celebrate ourselves, do our own thing. We want to continue walking as if there is no law, if there's no ditch on one side of the road and on the other, when what Christ is saying is, my garden is to be cared for. So listen, pastors and parents and church members, this is written to a pastor, but so especially pastors and elders, listen, it says, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one, this version says, disregard you. Some versions say despise you. We're living in the age of the public persona that is not matched by the private strength of personal life. We're living in the age of the masquerading religious businessman, the televangelist, who purports to be a teacher of God, but behind the scenes, he's a whitewashed sepulcher. We're living in the age of people who come to church, but they don't have time for God in their daily schedule, but they hold an office. The problem is the garden of their heart is corrupted and they hardly know how to deal with the garden of the church. So when it comes to a moment like this where somebody's standing behind this pulpit, just happens to be me, but it'll be somebody else in a few weeks and somebody else after that. When somebody is here and they have found the unction of the Lord, the power of the word, the filling of the spirit, the worst thing that can happen to the garden of the heart is that nobody can be able to say to you, you know what, that's a weed. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to destroy the precious plant of the beauty of Christ in your life. We're living in an age where wives are sometimes disrespected and sometimes disrespectful to their husbands. We're living in an age where pastors think the great goal of their job is just kind of keep the ship of, of not it's not of state, but the, sh the ship of church just kind of rolling along when in reality, the ship is taking on water, losing respectability in the common concourse of culture and making almost little to no difference in the up and coming generation or the generation that holds power. That's why Paul will say, listen, Titus, understand your job. You are to exhort and to reprove with all authority, and nobody is to despise you. They may not like you, but you better be a man of integrity. They may not readily hear what you're saying, but you better say it, because at the end of the day, the absence of saying it is blood on your hands and the spiritual eternal demise of the ones that are listening. Now, we don't believe that... Uh, I shouldn't say we don't believe. We don't commonly sense that this is really supposed to be a part of what goes on. I had somebody say to me the other day, not a member of this church, just one of the ones that tunes in online. Intellectual. They said to me, when I want a father talk, I tune into village. Now, I'm not sure they meant it as a compliment. <laughs> I'm not sure they thought they needed a spiritual leader. I know the other day I had another pastor stop by and talk with me about an encounter they had with this person after they made a pretty grave mistake. Spiritual authority exists. It can be abused. 
But when it's not exercised, everybody suffers. So it's important that leaders do justly love mercy and walk humbly. But I want to say to you today, friends, if you're a mom or a dad, make sure that you conduct yourself with enough integrity to where your children cannot easily despise you, even if they don't like what you said. If you're a leader in the church, friends, make sure that you're not somebody different at home or on the job than you project yourself to be when you're kneeling here having a prayer or making an offering appeal. But if you hold spiritual authority and you don't exercise it, woe be unto you and woe be unto everybody who's depending upon you to be who you are supposed to be. And just take a look around at our world and see what a mess it is. The church is culpable. They have fallen down on the job. They have abdicated their role as the voice of conscience for a society, especially one that celebrates liberty and opportunity. We have greed that's running rampant. We have half-hearted commitments to marriages and less than that to churches. And look at the mess we're in. And if we're going to have something different than what we've got, we're going to have to be something different than what we are, which is what I want to talk about now. So go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. The fruits of the Spirit and the fruits of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. What's going on? Why are certain things growing? Can it be different? Will it change? Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 6. It says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Now, I want to be very clear as we get ready to look at the fruits of the flesh or the works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. None of this can happen without a root cause. And what is that root cause? Well, I don't want to focus too much on the carnal mindedness. I think we all get that. But I do want to focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we just read that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Make sure you understand the book of Galatians. Paul is in a, he's in a desperate battle to retake the spiritual leadership teaching control of the church. Because people have come in and they've hijacked the inclinations to faithfulness of the church. And they're telling them, unless you're circumcised, you're not a real Christian. The only problem is circumcision was given to Abraham who couldn't have a baby with Sarah. Circumcision was given a physical sign to three generations of barren moms and dads that a miracle baby would be coming. And so from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, miracle babies came in the future view that a miracle baby would come that would make a miracle of remaking our hearts. But there's people telling them they need to go back to circumcision, which is a Old Testament rite of faith looking forward to a New Testament reality. And Paul says, what has happened to you? But what he tells them is the truth is that faith working through love is what actually is the new standard. Now, if we skip down just a few verses, let's go to verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. The modern day churches of which Seventh-day Adventism is not exempt have turned their freedom into a new form of bondage. We can assure you all the way to the gates of hell, and the truth of the matter is, is that that assurance won't do anything for you when you arrive at the gates of hell. Because the assurance that in Christ is a new obligation of love to serve one another, it's not a new permission to go live your secular, flesh-inclined inclinations while the church goes to hell in a handbag and the world is in worse trouble than that. We're to serve each other through love and we're not to make an excuse in the name of grace to do anything different. You were called to freedom. The freedom comes through serving in love. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. But I say to you, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. 
Now let's hit the pause button right there to make sure we understand how this works. There is some teaching in Adventism today that you're supposed to fall so head over heels in love with God that you don't have to fight against the flesh. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that even though you're filled with the Spirit, there is still a natural desire of the flesh that should not be carried out. That's what it says. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. This is good news for some of us because some of us had things opened up in the chapters of our childhood through trauma or wrong exposure to the wrong things which these devices want to keep ever before us. And for as much as we try to walk in the Spirit, it seems like always something's popping back up, popping back up, popping back up. Well, I've got good news for you. Just because some of those things were wrongly awakened and addictions and appetites aroused before their time, you're not stuck and you're not lost. The good news is that even though you're praying to be filled by the Spirit, the devil isn't giving up. He's not just walking away and saying, you know what? Leave him alone. He's filled by the Spirit. No, he doesn't do that, friends. He's going to fight you to the bitter end. But the good news is when you walk according to the Spirit and you set your mind on the things above, when you submit yourself to God and resist the devil, the Scripture says he has to flee from you. Now, he'll come back around. Don't worry. He doesn't give up. He's taking as many to hell with him as he can take. But the good news is, sometimes the desires of the flesh are waiting for you. Now listen, don't live in the temptation zone. The Bible says flee sexual immorality. Don't live in the temptation zone. That's why there's a wall up on this garden. That's why there's a watchtower in this garden. That's why you say, no, you're not reading that book. I don't care how many of your friends are reading. No, you're not playing that game. No, you're not watching that movie. No, you're not listening to that music. Because somebody should build a watchtower and say, you know what? The works of the flesh war against the Spirit of God. And they grow faster. The weeds grow faster. And they multiply more. We got a long-haired dog at my house. During certain times of the year, especially in the fall, the dog, who belongs to my daughter, but likes me more, likes to go on a walk with me. And my daughter says, don't take Jackie on the walk because she'll run off through the woods and she'll get all these burrs in her hair. Yeah, the devil has a way of making things stick to us that are hard to get out. And that's why maybe the dog on the leash is the compromise. But there's a wall and a tower in every effective home and church so that the works of the flesh can't get a jump start and crowd out the works of the Spirit. Verse 17. For the flesh sets a desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. Did you hear that? It's a battle. And by the way, let me just read this to you out of Steps of Christ. I hope it'll encourage you. It says, Like the wind which is invisible, yet the effects which are plainly seen and felt, the Spirit of God in its work upon the, is the Spirit of God in the work upon the human heart. That regenerating power which no human eye can see begets a new life in the soul. It creates a new being in the image of God. And while the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact while we cannot do anything to change our hearts or to bring ourselves into harmony with God, I'm going to read it again. Don't miss it. This isn't a pull yourself up by the bootstrap sermon. This is a notice what kind of plants are growing and go to God. So if it's the fruits of the evil one, you can say, Lord, there's a stone, there's a weed. I need help. And if you recognize something beautiful growing, you can say, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. But what I'm trying to tell you is the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, they're at war with each other. But listen to this. We cannot do anything to change our hearts or bring ourselves into harmony with God. Zero. You don't do it. It's a miracle. But once that gift of repentance is given us and we want to be different, the battle's on. While we must not trust all to ourselves or our good works... 
We must not trust at all to ourselves or our good works. Our lives will reveal whether the grace of God is dwelling within us. A change will be seen. Here we go. Hang on tight. In the character, the habits. And here we go, friends. The last one may be the hardest for a group of first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Seventh-day Adventists. The pursuits. You know, there's a bunch of you out there standing on the shoulders of a bunch of other people. You're getting the best education that's ever been given on the face of the planet. You're in the nicest buildings with the most amazing technological equipment. But you're pursuing things that the pioneers and the faithful ones before us didn't deem as worthy as some of the other things like lost people. A change will be seen in the character, the habits, and the pursuits. The contrast will be clear and decided between what they have been and what they are. Now, the last sentence might be the most encouraging because there's a lot of conscientious people listening to me here today. I don't believe most people came here because they didn't care. Steps of Christ, page 57. The character is revealed. This is the end of the paragraph. Not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. Somebody texted me not long ago, and they were, I think, very distraught with themselves because they had gone somewhere and done something, and I think they surprised themselves that they had done it. Now, I know this person to be a genuine, principled Christian, a committed Christian. And I think they were so discouraged with themselves that they just needed to hear this sentence. The character is revealed not by the occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and actions. Now, this is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. I know people who genuinely are seeking to be filled with the Spirit. It's their daily prayer. They carry God into the ordinary affairs of their life, and occasionally they do things that surprise them and the people around them. Take heart, dear friend. That was the devil stalking you, and while he may have scored a temporary victory, you're still God's, and you're still going God's way. But I need to say something else. There's no excuse for the person who's letting the weeds grow in their heart, and every day somebody's having to say, man, that's a noxious smelling weed. Dishonesty doesn't work before the maker and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He loves you. He's not here to condemn you. But he's also going to say, that's not the plant that should be growing in the garden of your heart. Verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. All right, now let's just solve this one real quick. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. You don't hardly have to go anywhere. The enemies of Adventism would like to suggest that somehow the Sabbath is gone. It's not. I'm going to show you in the book how simple it is to explain what this is in context, in the same book, Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 23. But before the faith, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which is later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the law. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about a religious experience that Isaiah says, God planted a good vineyard, but it went wrong. Where did it go wrong? How do we get bitter grapes? How do we get sour grapes? It went wrong because instead of a faith relationship with God above, they looked to the law to justify themselves, not knowing their heart was bad and no amount of behavioral justification was going to make things right in the way God saw all of us or them. The law is a pretty poor tutor. It's not the mom. It's not the dad. It's not the dear Savior Jesus that can remake the heart. There is a law of love that Paul says, when we live by love, we have fulfilled the law. And it's quoted in, in Galatians 5, love your neighbor as yourself. That law is so much higher. It's not just about not taking somebody else's stuff. It's not just about don't be violent, don't be covetous, don't be adulterous. No, it's about actually loving people. 
It's about actually loving God. The tutor of the law is not the savior of the redeemer who wrote the law. And the law is not done away with. That's easy to see in reading Paul's writings. So we better understand what he's saying. It's time to quit trying to self-justify through a relationship with the law. Come to Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit. Go to a higher standard and know the greater joy of letting God live in you. Verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Here we go. I group them three ways. Immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Now, if you're listening to me here today and you're in an immoral relationship, either with a device vicariously or with a person, I'm appealing to you, turn away from it. Jesus Christ can give you the power to do it. You can be in love with Christ and you can fall in love with a real person, not an experience that's immoral. And I, I know that this challenge does exist inside the church of God. And someone actually brought it to my attention this week inside of this church. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. You got a problem with this device? Confess it to somebody. Confess it. The younger you are, the more important it'll be that you confess it. You would be better off to be the stigmatized only 13-year-old without a phone and be happy in your own heart than to be the person who's hiddenly shackled to vicarious or virtual immorality. Parents, are you listening? Even the worldlings are figuring out that this device is the undoing of the next generation. They're writing laws. They're testifying against Meta and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. They're writing laws. Why would we be last to the game to wake up and say, uh-oh, and maybe it's time for our schools at the academy level to go ahead and say, you know what? We did education for hundreds of years without this. We can probably still do it. And that way there's no sexting. I mean, the stories people have told me are terrible. That's the first group. Immorality, impurity, or sensuality. No, you shouldn't be watching those things. No, 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 which is one of the most powerful words in the vocabulary of any human being. Then idolatry and sorcery. I kind of keep those on the not ideally inside the church challenge so much. Then we come to the church challenges. Enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Hey, I hate to say it. There's some of those churches where all of those weeds are growing at the same time and nobody knows what to do about it. Do you know what, friends? Friends? You don't need to be jealous of another single person on the whole planet. God took the trillions and trillions ad infinitum exponentially, and he made you you. You, you were born prettier than some and uglier than others. You were born richer than some and poorer than others. You were born smarter than some and dumber than others. But you know what? None of that changes the fact that God gave you a special appointment to fulfill his will in the 21st century. Can somebody say amen? amen? You don't drive as nice a car as some other people, and you live in a much better house than lots. Your clothes may not be as good as some other people's, but you probably have 100 times more than 90% of the world's population. God didn't make you to try to be somebody else he made you to faithfully be who he called you to be. And so we don't need to be striving and fighting and envying and outbursting and all the things that are on this list. But some people are leaders and they've got lots of education and lots of money and lots of history, but it's whitewashed sepulcherism and some pastor or some group of elders or somebody needs to stand up and say, it doesn't matter how long you've been the leader of this church, you're propagating weeds and your heart is manifestly full of them. But enough of that. Let's get on to the other. Envy and drunkenness and carousing and things like this. He goes out with a blaze of ugliness, which I hope is not in this church. But I want to say to every young person, you know, I got gas yesterday at the gas station across the street. And the marijuana smell that was pouring out of the very nice white Chevrolet truck was just astounding. As the 20-something got into it. You know, as Adventists, we used to write songs about the stinky weed. Well, it was tobacco back then, and it still is tobacco. But I want to tell you, 
it's almost like municipalities are falling over themselves to make sure that they have laws that protect the use of marijuana. Do yourself a favor. If you think something's weird, investigate it. If it doesn't look right, ask about it. And if you need help because you've started down a road, say something. Your parents and your teachers and your pastors love you. They will help you. Be careful and gentle, parents, whenever anybody comes and confesses something to you. They need your help then. All right, let's get on to the better stuff, could we? But the fruits of the Spirit, verse 22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. What is love? Love is patient. I've never met a person who's patient, especially when I've made a mistake that I don't love and adore. <laughs> you be patient with me when I make a mistake, I can just tell you, you just went up notches in my book. And by the way, all human beings are really kind of calibrated the same way. Now, some hearts are so hard, they don't respond. And I want to say something to you dads especially. You must seek the Holy Spirit to be patient. Of course, moms need to be too, but I, I think it's more of a dad problem. And of course, it's a human problem. Some of you have employees. Some of you have students. Nothing is more beautiful. And of course, love could cover everything. But we know in 1 Corinthians 13, the very first thing is patience. Love is patient. Love is kind. Joy. Let me say something to you, friends. If you're pursuing the wrong things and you're not living a life of spiritual integrity, you're never going to get to the joy cycle of Christianity. You've got to surrender. You've got to say, Lord, I need help. I can't let go. You've got to accept the fact that God, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, put it all on hold, became a human being, would have died just for you. You want to talk about joy? Every bit of the cosmos is bound up in the creator and in him all things exist and have their being. And he said, you know what? It just wouldn't be the same without Matt or Bill or Madeline. This is joy. My sins are forgiven. The problem is if I get a false assurance in Christ, a false grace, my sins are forgiven long enough for me to go back out and do the same things I was doing before. There's no wall. There's no tower. There's no self-control. There's no word no. I'm here to tell you, friends, the happiest people in the world are Christian people who really know Jesus and love Jesus and have said, it's all yours, Jesus, and they've suffered because they've given up things they thought they really loved. They found out they didn't love them as much as they did and they loved other things better. Joy in a marriage. Peace. There's nothing like putting your head down on the pillow or going for a walk all by yourself, talking with God and having absolute assurance that you're his child. Patience, we're back at that again, must be a big deal. It seems like God kind of has a long patience, thousands of years for Israel. And now it appears the New Testament church is in thousands of years too. Kindness, the Bible says what is desired in a man, in the book of Proverbs it says is kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. I was in Aldi the other night. What does it mean to be faithful? Doesn't it kind of mean like if I'm a man, even though there's other pretty women, I keep my heart for my wife? Doesn't it mean if I'm a woman that I keep my heart for the man that I promise to love? Doesn't it mean that if I start something, I finish it? Doesn't it mean that I'm true to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to me? Doesn't it mean that if I make a mess, I clean it up? Now I'm meddling, aren't I? Does it mean that I make a mess in the kitchen and I leave it for my mom to clean up? Or does it mean I clean it up? But let's just use the example from less than 48 hours ago. So I'm in Aldi shopping. Thursday night, my wife and I, sometimes we go out to eat. Sometimes we don't. And then we go buy groceries together. And here I am in Aldi. 
I walk in, I go past the produce, I cut around to the next aisle, still got some produce, got the condiments. Then I go up the middle aisle. And when I'm all said and done, I like to collect the banana boxes at the beginning there. They're good boxes to take my food home in. And when I'm all said and done, we're standing in line. My, I don't know if my wife had to go get something, but she said to me, I think the person with the dog, the dog went to the bathroom over there. So she says something to the teller, and I go to check and see. And I'm thinking to myself, there's a lot of people standing in line. Nobody's going to get there for a little while. And so I grab one of those plastic janitor signs that says the floor is wet. Now, here's the problem. It's not that dogs don't need to go to the bathroom sometimes. I grabbed that yellow plastic sign because I thought to myself, the tellers aren't going to get there, and they didn't sign up to pick up somebody's doggy doo-doo. They signed up to stock shelves and care about customers. And before they get there, since it's right in the middle of the aisle, somebody's going to step in it and smear it all the way down the aisle, not even notice because they're looking at the merchandise. So I take that plastic sign, and I walk to the middle aisle of the middle of the store, almost where the aisles crisscross, and I set it down there over the issue. <laughs> but what really got to me, I turned to leave because my wife was already checked out and was heading out the door. And they're standing in the line at the, in the, the cash register aisle is the man who owns the dog. Now, dogs usually have to pause to do what they do. And I'm thinking to myself, how come he didn't do anything about this? Faithfulness is kind of a big deal. Of course, God should be on our list of priorities. Now, therefore, those who belong to Jesus Christ, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And there's where the real stick is. We want a Christ without a cross. We want a spirit without a battle. But if we live by the spirit, in other words, if we say we profess the spirit, verse 25, let us also walk by the spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, and envying one another. I'm going to tell you, friends, some homes are ruined because mom and dad don't know what they're doing. Some churches are a mess because the pastors are either too ignorant or too cowardice or too uncommitted and too loving, unloving, to go the extra mile and bear and exercise their spiritual authority properly. Our society should not go down the tubes because of cowardice and lack of spiritual integrity. Our lives are to be a place where the Spirit has the freedom to reign in our hearts. And we understand that sometimes there's pruning and sometimes there's weeding and sometimes there's stone removing and sometimes there's battling the enemies who want to get in and ruin and, of course, eventually there's a harvest. That harvest, well, God gives us little foretaste. When a church or a home actually works together in love, understands structure, isn't biting, devouring, having outbursts of wrath, when a church actually works together, when a family actually works together, it's one of the most powerful things that can happen. But I want to say this in conclusion. If one of those works of the flesh is manifesting in your life, don't lie to yourself and deny it. And don't lie to the people who have been trying to talk to you about it. Because I learned a long time ago when I bite into an apple, if it's been dropped, you know, you can't always tell. When you bite into a bruised spot, you don't need a PhD in fruitology to figure out this piece is no good. 
And I know from mowing grass with my kids, because they had a lawn mowing business years ago, we used to mow the ABC manager's house in Indiana, and he had a lot of fruit trees, and he didn't ever pick the fruit. I can tell you, I could tell you which trees produce the sweetest fruit. And maybe the soil needs some work. I just want to say this to you. God's church should be such a bright, shining light, but it can only be if we as individuals say, Lord, here's my heart. It's your property. Keep it for me because I can't keep it for myself. Save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self, and raise me up into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich currents of your love can flow through my soul. That's a prayer from the pen of Ellen White. It's one of the most beautiful prayers I've ever read. The idea that Christ would save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self. He'd mold me into his image and that he'd raise me up out of the temptation zone much of the time to where the rich currents of his love could flow through my soul. Some of you are too busy. You're pursuing money and it's ruining you. It's ruining your kids. Some of you are too busy and you don't have time to read the Bible or pray. Some of you are too busy and you barely have time to make commitments to anything except your priority system. Our churches are suffering because somebody needs to say, you know what, there's weeds in the garden. Some things need pruned off, pruned out of your life. Our churches are suffering because sometimes somebody won't say, you know what, that's a work of darkness. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. Of course, we need to be kind and gentle and wise with each other. But I'm appealing to you today. Some of you are so busy getting your grades lined up for that future graduate school or that college you want to get into that you're missing out on sitting at the feet of Jesus every day. Listen, you want a good life? The secrets have never changed. There's no new rules to guide good marriages, good churches, good homes. They're the same old rules that have existed. But more than the rules, there's the living Christ who makes a new desire, a new life come into what you're doing. Only Jesus can take you from under the tutor, which is the law, to the experience with the Redeemer, lawgiver, one who puts the laws on your heart. And so in this closing song, I want to encourage you to make a commitment to Jesus if he's speaking to you today about something, a stone that needs removed, a weed that needs pulled, a branch that needs pruned. And if some of your homes don't have the proper hedge and wall around them, it's time to put it up. And if somebody wants to call you a legalist, call you a legalist all you want. But you're not letting the wolf come in to steal, kill, and destroy. May Jesus give us all hope that in our character, our habits, and our pursuits would be after that which matters most and is dearest to us. You are the pearl of great price to Jesus Christ. He paid the price for you. Would you turn your life over to him? I'm inviting you during this closing song to in your own mind give Jesus permission to be the master gardener of your heart so the most beautiful fruit could appear and the greatest joy could be yours. Yeah, you give up a lot to follow Jesus, but it doesn't look like much once you understand what he gave up to get you back. May God help us all. Let's stand together as we sing.